hugging the book wherever you are you know it's like an identity we as a conversation have moved on from what is feminism it is a given that if you don't know feminism by now you're ignorant of course marriage is a fish market it doesn't matter whether women are dying inside or hating the fact but they'll have this prim face and laden with jewels books have a great way of bringing you together in noise they become your silence and in silence they become your noise namaskar ada तो आज के गेस्ट एपिसोड में हमारे साथ है शैली चोपड़ा शैली शी द पीपल डॉट टीवी की फाउंडर है और उसी के साथ एक लेखक भी आज के इस एपिसोड में हमने बहुत सारी बातें की उनकी पसंदीदा किताबें फिल्में सीरीज फूड ट्रैवल वगैरह रिकमेंडेशन के बारे में भी और उसके साथ साथ उनकी नई किताब और उनके बतौर लेखक किताबों के साथ निजी रिश्ते के बारे में तो उम्मीद करते हैं आपको ये बातचीत पसंद आएगी गुड मॉर्निंग शैली Welcome to Kitabi Cabins, a channel by Chalchitra Talks. So we are very excited to have you today and take recommendations from you and talk about your book as well. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. To begin with, uh, tell us about your journey as a reader or what kind of uh, relationship you have with books. Well, I've had a very long relationship with books. Um, I read large number of books and fairly leg- regularly. uh but it didn't start too early i mean i uh, i have two children who started when they were 3 even if they couldn't read but they could certainly feel the books and see pictures and admire them i started when i was 11 i think my uh, the opportunity to read was always present uh, i belong to a family of readers and writers but i hadn't taken to it and i took to it in you know i still remember the exact place in the library in gwalior where my parents were posted and i used to study where i uh sat and started reading books uh i read some books much later than most kids uh, but it was uh, fascinating to me what these books were doing so um yeah in a in a strange way i missed out the entire enid blyton phase and i went straight to the nancy drews and then i started reading you know all of the other books that were around back then the hardy boys and the tom sawyer or whatever else and then there were abridged shakespeare versions in school so that's how i started i started a little later than i would have liked but i think i've caught up having written five books and read voraciously in that journey to journalism uh and then as an author and now as an entrepreneur reading is my second skin can you tell us about your favorite books or the books you often refer to as a writer you explored more literature so in that journey as a writer which are your favorite books right now so i think one of the things with me and books is that i tend to spend majority of my year reading non fiction in the quest for knowledge i would say that's one of my key reasons uh, books are not necessarily my distraction from my current work they reinforce a little bit of what i'm doing or what i'm searching for in that light i tend to read a large number of books of late that are focused on women Uh, I have worked in the world of women for the last eight years, um, really with a lot more uh, scrutiny and interest and enthusiasm. So I've read a bunch of books um, recently. I could take you through them. So, for example, I've read *Cast* by Isabel Wilkinson, fairly thick treatise on what's happening in the world of caste around the world. We are talking in the month of Dalit history. Uh, there's tremendous amount of layers to our world you know when it comes to that um i also read ant among elephants based on stories uh, and a narrative that brings the life the caste structures in our country uh, a book i've particularly enjoyed reading is invisible women it's by caroline uh, criado i read it about 7 years ago and to me that book has uh, perhaps fired up a lot in me to think about books and data and how numbers can tell a lot if you try to find something and they don't if you don't i also feel reading doesn't have to be reading the written word so i read a lot of illustrated books uh, i'm a huge fan of folly dunbar who scribbles her experiences um she has a book called hello mom I think another good book is Rage Becomes Her by a journalist I admire called Sorali Chemali and she has celebrated the idea of anger and I'm a big fan of anger uh, because I think for women change can't come without presenting rage on the table. You also mentioned that uh, you spend most of your time reading non-fiction. People choose to be on extremes either uh, 
the non-fiction part or the fiction, but there is always verses. What's your opinion on that? So uh, you know, I um, I've read a lot of fiction in the past. It's about trade-offs for me. It's like saying that listen, if I have time and I'm wanting to learn about something, or am I wanting to get into a world where there might be learning, but it'll sort of be story, right? So I I made the choice of leaving my fiction time spent on television and series and my non-fiction time spent on books. I find it very difficult to watch non-fiction uh because my work is already pretty intense when I work with women and uh, you know I know the deeper end of their own journeys and stories which uh, not only are moving but they just remind you how unequal and difficult the world of women is. Um and so I tend to not watch uh mm. non-fiction just to keep that fear away and use that as my time for entertaining myself uh but books um are many reasons on the non-fiction side that I I read it one that I love underlining stuff and going back to it and I scribble on all my books about words and phrases I hang on to so yeah I don't really make a very hard choice I have read fictionalized non-fiction in the past and I don't pick up books often based on genre I'm very open about genre so I would probably read a column of funny articles that the New York Times published and then bound them into a book um what I would read a book that's trying to use a fictional character to tell a non-fiction journey no hard and fast um, I don't I don't make very stark choices about this as you mentioned that you like to make notes or write in your books so do you prefer paperbacks over kindle yes I'm a bit tardy with the Kindle. I have some great books on the Kindle. Unfortunately, I've not been able to finish them. Um the reason for that is that I get hassled when these pages in Kindle just move some fast and then I'm lost and I'm spending about 5 minutes going back to where was I? And the other thing is just hugging the book wherever you are. You know, it's like an identity. Um I imagine myself like you're in a new city, you're passing some time, you want to sit in a park. You're alone. You know, you're you're with a book, right? and you can walk with it you don't look purposeless you don't have to scroll through reels you're over yeah. the book and it feels very very uh, connected absolutely so um you also mentioned about how you prefer uh, fiction on screen so tell us about some uh, your favorite recommendations of films or series of late i've been watching spanish lo- not because of the language of course it's something that i it sort of falls nicely on my ears and i'm learning spanish through ott let me put it that way uh but i think um one of the reasons i love some of these spanish shows is that they make women very very real and powerful they keep women very alive or or like this mexican uh serial i was watching called monarca two women big fight over a tequila empire you know um how she navigates the men in her family in these spanish serials i see these women out there trying to break stuff i like strategy i like evilness i like meanness in the in the thinking and you know how they are navigating it's hard work so i'm yes. loving that um i i watched another um slightly cheesy maybe i just say that even though i've watched it so many times a, a very long series called velvet then another one called 100 dias which is like a couple's fight and they decide to separate for 100 days to see how they're going to find their lives brilliant um very real and not at all like india soapy stuff but off lane i've also watched some good um, spy drama i love spy drama and thrillers um again women at the helm i watched this um i think it's called traitor traitor has got another woman at the top and she's um, really the traitor uh this is uh, world war 2 again world war very very exciting stuff i just to know that there were women doing stuff during world war that itself to me is a phenomenal reason to watch because mm. our world war just showed men it's only through a children's book that i discovered recently that india lost 6 million soldiers in the second world war 6 million is the size of a bunch of countries around us we don't have enough of a history in that most world wars ignore the role of india so i'm just trying to say that how reading about history is another great way of bringing a lot 
Uh, another, yeah, maybe we'll go on talking about lots of books, but I think now I'm thinking about a bunch of history oriented books, very good ones. Yes, you can mention some names if, if right now you're My thinking. My book is by an author that many of us are familiar with called Anita Anand. This book is called Sophia. I think Anita is more famous for some of her recent work, including Kohinoor, uh, written with William Darimpul. But um, Sophia, brilliant book, very thick, a story of a woman who is the daughter of a Sardar king. Um, whose genesis lies in the Ranjit Singh family in Kapurthala. That's a princely state that I belong to. Um, and always heard the name Ranjit Singh, Jagajit Singh, and all of them around me just knew them as names of you know schools and clubs or whatever, but never really knew the history as things would be. I discovered it through the story of Sophia, who is um, just about visited India a few times has an international mother, I forget her origin, I think it was French. Um, and how through World War, they, they remain around to raise their hand and fund the suffragette movement in the United Kingdom. I never thought that Indian origin women were doing this stuff. Then I've read a book called The Women of Raj, again, reflecting on both strong and weak women of the period of the British in India. And weak largely because many of them succumb to the need for having these high tea parties under little umbrellas and pretending and talking about the summer in India and all of that. Tell us about uh, in detail about your book. Sisterhood Economy, as um, the book says, is off by for women and men is in bracket. So it's really for everyone to read because it will make them more aware of the surroundings the challenges, the love, the mad life, the fun lives of women. Um, it's, a, it's a fearless and fun attempt at telling the stories of women through what the society thinks they are really. Sasumas, daughters, mothers, gharelu girls, bitches, badass, becharis. So the book's titles are actually my favorite part. One of the stories, and this is so deeply linked to my journey on Instagram with, with people, the second chapter is called the Indian marriage fish market. Of course, marriage is a fish market. Of course, the Indian market is known to the world because of the kind of money we spent on well, weddings. It doesn't matter whether women are dying inside or hating the fact, but they'll have this prim face and laden with jewels propagated even more now with the New York store of Sabyasachi. I think like the wedding, right? But girls on Instagram and through my research, when I met them, said, I am doing my third PhD. Another said, I'm so decided that I'm going to study all my life. So I said, why? She said, it's the easiest way to push marriage. And I was like, amazing. That's why you're studying. So we have highly educated women around us who don't necessarily want to put those studies to anything. They want degrees. So there is no fight over marriage. And these are the kind of conversations that started emerging. Then I remember seeing one woman showing her PhD thesis, little bit in a swaddle, holding her hands and saying, celebrate my PhD as much as my baby. Hey. I saw this on Instagram. I was like, wow, you're right. We, we celebrate India, I mean, women's milestones, not just in India, I suppose everywhere, but in India, we celebrate them in a real big way with drums and everything is when they get married. Now you have arrived. Now you have settled. Now you have moved on, you know? And I'm like, no, that doesn't work like that, right? And so another chapter here is called the sixth chapter, Bichari Badass or Bitch. Why? Because women have always shared and talked about being labeled. If a woman is sitting alone, hi Bichari. If she's talking her you know, heart out in a meeting in her office, oh, she's way too badass for us. We can't deal with her. If she's um, somebody who just back answers a guy or a girl, oh, such a bitch. Why? Because we can't take a woman from not conforming what is expected of her and what is prescriptive of her for the last decades and decades and decades and centuries. So when a woman says no, she's like, how the hell can you say no? You are expected to say yes. And I think those stories are very fascinating because in the book, the way the stories are written, they're just, they're funny. Um, you know, my idea was not to kind of lecture people. I interviewed 5,000 women 
Each of their stories are hilarious, right? I mean, one woman talks about her experience of being a caretaker to her mother and how every day her relatives are like, who grows up to be a big child and then looks after their mother? And she's like, do you know how horrific that sounds? How about remembering that every time a guy grows up, you're like, Beta bada ho gaya, ab to apni ka dhyan But when a girl does that, like, how can you do that? How can that be your life goal? So there's a big chapter on single women are rocking it because these single women are like, you can keep saying whatever you want. I'm enjoying with my herb garden. My mother and I are chilling and seeing the world. You can keep finding boys for me and making some sort of matchmaking in heaven. So I think the, the fundamental idea of this book was to be a power packed insight in the lives of really crazy women who are constantly being judged and they're like, I'm not listening to you guys. Just wake up and smell the coffee. It's a bit like that. And, and that's why I think when we talk about women who are living with their mother-in-laws, okay, there's a big chapter called the Sasuma Factor, Sasuma yes. Curse. I mean, it's self-explanatory that the mother-in-law is always expected to be the Lalita Pawar and she you know, always pushes the girl to do some jhadu pocha or something or whatever is the equivalent in a modern world, right? Um, shut up during an argument or whatever. But I argue exactly the opposite. All the girls in my DM, Many times even men, they're like, I can't deal with my mama. She's just saying things I can't agree with. My mother. Mother-in-law to dur ki baat hai. Right? So in sisterhood economy, the idea has been to be a spin top. What do you call it? Lattu. Right? Hmm. So when we say ki bhai mother-in-law is the curse, actually mothers are the curse. Mother-in-laws have the potential of not being the curse if we market them better and say mother-in-law achhi ho sakti hai. Mother-in-law kahegi yaar kya karna hai mere ko, why should I take this curse on my head? Let me be nice to her and she can, she can live her life. Best is she has her own kitchen, I have my own kitchen. You know what I'm trying to say? So mother-in-laws hold the key to improving health, family life. Hmm. Mothers hmm. are raising 50% of our population and they're also uh, women themselves. They're getting a lot of things wrong. So I think the idea of sisterhood economy has been, which by the way has been endorsed by Masaba, by Faye D'Souza, by economist Vivek Debroy, politician Priyanka Chaturvedi, and I wanted a host of people to read it because I know that this is common. You can be the top politician in your country, including the president. You'll be asked to pick up your plate or somebody will say, Acha, apni plate lo, apne husband ki lo, apne father ki lo, apne bachon ki lo. Right? Nothing changes. So yeah. sisterhood economy is a it's a great lens on uh, fun facts, great experiences, a book that will last a lifetime for you and become a great reference, whether you're in school, college or working to say, you know what, this is the reason I'm changing. This is the reason I'm changing my way I raise my child. This is the way I'm doing this or that. You also mentioned about the social media part in the beginning. Can we get any recommendation of any social media handles which you think which are very inspiring or, or people should, you know, follow them? for their content. You mean other than my own? I'm just joking. Yeah, of course. So um, I think you should follow She The People TV. The reason I say that is because I, it's not like I, I have alone built it. The power of She The People TV on Instagram has been you all. We started it as a handle. But every single day by dropping like hundreds and thousands of DMs in our inbox, you've told us what is going on in your lives. So I always say this. She the People was an idea, became a website, became a channel. Today it's a movement and I have nothing to do with it. People take it and make it their own. We as a conversation have moved on from what is feminism. It is a given that if you don't know feminism by now, you're ignorant. But what is interpreted as feminism by different women with different circumstances and different approaches and different economic strata or castes or cultures is the conversation. Why? Because we don't want to alienate. No cancel culture at the people at all. Your feminism is yours. Somebody else's feminism is somebody else's. Does that mean the two have to be identical? No. So I think it's important to let, um, let us stand by what really feminism, I think, stands for, which is leaving everyone to make the choice of what choice they want to make. Right. Hmm. Um, and so I think definitely that's one handle. Uh, among the other handles that I tend to follow, you know, so I follow your handle, for example, right? It gives me insights into what people are saying, what they're reading, what they're not reading. I follow the handles of many, um, you know, book authors. Mm -hmm. um, I follow Mary Popova. I read a lot of her books. Figuring mm -hmm. is a mouthful of a book, honestly. 
who tells you the great stories and struggles of women navigating their journey, perhaps in a slightly tedious way than I would have liked it, but it's so rich in language that I, even if I read two pages a day, I feel like I learned a few new words. So I follow a bunch of those handles. I, um, I follow a lot of Kathak and Bharatnatyam dancers. Rama Vaidyanathan is one such person. The Usha J sisters who've uh, given a rap to Bharatnatyam. Again, love them. There's a sense of newness. Uh, so if you ask me, a lot of my reading and consumption of content is remixed. I love the people who are collaborative. Hmm. Because I think there's a space for purists. And the pure forms are available. Hmm. But there's an opportunity to see what is the higher ground purists, pure forms can take. So I listen to music that's often remixed, even some Hindi music that's remixed. It's very important that we have space and ability to absorb new recipes of original ingredients. So you also mentioned about music. So tell us about your favorite artists. Oh, that's a long list. Okay, uh, let's start with some Indian ones. I am an absolute fan of Ritwiz, pretty much like most of his songs. But again, his collaborative work, excellent. There's one song called Khamoshi with Kanchan, which is great. Then there's his work with Nuclear, great. I'm a huge fan of, I think her name is Anumita Nadesan. She has a great voice, a very jazzy voice in my assessment. I am a huge fan of Ariva. Ariva is a Tamil singer who highlights caste issues uh, and spotlights problems that people with caste lines are facing today. Uh, I just love Tamil as a language. I listen to a lot of Rabindra Sangeet, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Bengali essentially. I listen to George Da, the Bengalis would know who he is. Then I listen to Hemant Mukherjee. I listen to this amazing singer called Shahana. Shahana is on Instagram, S-A-H-A-N-A. -A -A. Just beautiful voice and uh, her ability to capture somebody's thoughts, even though they don't understand Bengali is um, huge, you know. Uh, so there's um, there those. Then there are, there's a gamut of English singers that I love. I'm a huge fan of Nora Jones. I was reading about Nora Jones long before she became Nora Jones. Her original name is Gitanjali, as named by her father, Ravi Shankar. I met Ravi Shankar back in 1999, and I got a book signed by him. And I remember reading this, and I'm thinking, oh, this person does look like Nora Jones. And why is it she referred to as Gitanjali in the entire book? And there were no phones, and there was not enough Google or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember. I think Google happened in 99, right? So. A fascinating journey. Um, I have enjoyed Ray Charles. Um, again, Ray Charles and Nora Jones did a combination back then. Great uh, sort of medley. Huge fan of uh, Shakti. Michael Jackson, oof, total blood on the dance floor for uh, that guy. Shaggy, there's Madonna, there's Dua Lipa, there's Elton John and Dua Lipa doing really amazing stuff off late. So just having fun, you know, while listening to some of these guys. I like Jeffrey Iqbal. I don't know if you guys are into traditional music, but Chap Tilak has got a complete mm. different look with Jeffrey Iqbal, different feel. I'm a drummer in the making. And therefore, all of this music is lifting my spirits day in, day out. Uh, so that's that's me. Um. Do you have any favorite podcasts? Any recommendation for us? There are some podcasts I listen to often. I listen to, who's now, I, I would say, a bit of a friend, given how much he knows about me, Amit Varma, Seen and Unseen. And then I listen to The Guilty Feminist by Deborah Francis White. I also listen to Pip and Posey, which is a children's book podcast. That's pretty much it. You also mentioned in the beginning that, you know, how books can help you in the moments of your solitude while you are traveling? So, you know, books have a great way of bringing you together in, uh, in noise. They become your silence and in silence, they become your noise. So I actually often would sit on that little sofa right at the back when uh, it's a really balmy afternoon, everyone's sleeping on a Sunday. And it would just give me a lot of peace to sit here and read my book. I spent like days and days building my library, which is where I am. 
so it does give me a lot of uh, happiness uh, to sit by myself drinking something and reading a book um i have read at kabun park which is mm. thick foliage and the sun rays just sort of seeping through and i was sitting on a little piece of rock with my book uh, by papova figuring and just reading pages after pages with people just walking by um and just feeling so connected with nature and light sometimes i read even on a plane but it's not my favorite place to read i like to cut out the noise so it's often something in my ear covid i remember fortunate enough to live in a building where there's a lot of green space i would just go down just lie down on the carpet of grass have my two kids and read aloud some words and tell them to make sentences out of it so very much so that person any travel recommendations so i'm not a fan of traveling for places okay. because they're okay. I travel for experiences in places, right? So mm. long before people started talking about Morocco or their football team became the flavor of the season, I went in 2007 to Morocco. The country is stunning. We are now perhaps glamorizing the idea of Tangiers. Uh, back when I went, it was just as beautiful and alive. Uh, but I, what I remember from these travels, Tangiers, for example, is my time spent on the top of a cliff. at somebody's house looking into the sunset um and seeing how different people in different cultures have their own versions of rich and famous um or sitting by the central street of tangiers and going into a flea market and buying a string of random pearls which i still wear so often and i never forget how that that flea market looked older men would sit with their hookahs and coffee outside shops like on chairs in in a queue and and just watch passers by the idea of watching passers by in india is completely absent somehow there is this amazing charm of of sitting in a cafe outside the vatican in rome or outside this just watching people mm. watching people to me is such a great way of soaking in the world 2007 i wasn't thinking about my feminist streak at all but now that i think of it i i was sort of horrified looking at how many men were there in the street and how few women were there but even then morocco was far more progressive than i had ever been to a place before i would wholeheartedly recommend morocco and a place called essaouira which is jimi hendrix countryside as they call it mm. literally be a dervish meet a dervish and enjoy yourself there i love rome i mean i just love italy uh, and i don't love it because it has the colosseum uh yes there's history and there's this admiration for it but the fact that i can sit and enjoy a drink in a very historic place and wonder what happened below that floor is is a very powerful thought how about your favorite food i love food i'm a fan of kolivara kitchens which is um, you no know, one place it's essentially people fisher women and the amazing food fisher women of maharashtra make spice loads of love and deep fried So that's one. Mm, I love Kolapuri food. Really love Kolapuri spicy food. Um I am a diehard fan of every kind of cuisine that I've eaten in Tamil Nadu. Internationally I love Moroccan food. Uh also because I started cooking it back when I went. And the reason I like it is because of the story of how Moroccan food is. Basically the women, older women of the house have these recipes by their head. and they use just two or three spices maybe even one sometimes to spice something i like simple food i don't like crazy jazzy food maybe kolapuri is an exception there because they're like oh just bring it all on because other than that i just like the simplicity the poriyal of south india is one of my favorites just coconut and one vegetable yeah so i think i'm a person who looks like she would love a very very busy world but i find the simplest things in my life to be the most special so yes uh, we we actually have so many recommendations now about everything music and podcasts and food of course so um, you were you were about to mention the story regarding the book signing uh, yes oh good that you remembered so i am a, i you know when i was growing up that was the era of people where autograph books and autograph diaries and scrap books were like flourishing every human being had two or three of them can you fill my autograph book can you fill my autograph book where basically it's like this entire conversation in writing essentially right my favorite this my favorite that and all of that and i was kind of really 
dejected with this whole concept. I was like, this sounds complete nonsense. It's like begging people to do something which nobody should have to. And that's how when I started reading, I realized that, you know, one should ask people to sign something where there is a piece of them. So I started uh, getting my book signed by authors. Um, and I have a very priceless collection of books signed from Orhan Pamuk, who I forgot to mention as my one of my favorite authors. Oh. I have at least three books signed by him. And I think he almost was worried I was getting my entire bookshelf signed by him of his books. So he told me three is it. Then I have books by Eric Hobsbawm, again, talking of nonfiction history. I read a lot. Now he's no more. I remember fighting with my boss at NDTV and going uh, for this, saying that it's really important to me. And he said, no, this can't be that important. I said, no, it's very important for me. He's in India. I want to get these books signed. Um, and then I have Noam Chomsky. I have Warren Buffett. I have Tom Hanks. I have Graham Greene, Nadim Godimo. Uh, so I've got a bunch of books that have been signed. And they are really my priceless, um, you know, collection. Collections. Of, um, of things that I like get signed yeah is there anything more you want to tell us about your book uh, quickly yes um, actually a lot um, yes. one is that I am a fan of people loving their own books I'm that person I don't write anything that I don't love and if I write something that I love then I really like the world to feel that you know they should read it too other than the fact that I always feel that uh, in our world we are our biggest ambassadors, so please go out there, pick up my book, tell me what you think. Enjoy it, because I'm more than certain that many of you would love it. Be part of the sisterhood. Be part of change. Be part of the need for both men and women to recognize the other side of the world that they have not had a chance to read about. I have really enjoyed this conversation with Kitabi Cabins. And the reason for that is that you actually asked me to run down memory lane on things I've read, things I do and why I do them. So I'd, um, if anyone who is looking for recommendations, do check them out.